All right, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, my name is John Olson, I'm the President of the Society. It's great to have you here. Uh, we do these meetings monthly, and we'll have our usual format today, which will start with the presentation and then our open mic. And if you want to explain the open mic, um, make sure you're on our mailing list, make sure you're a member and you're on our mailing list, and I will give instructions about that. We do that those signups a week in advance of the open mic, and it's quite lovely. Um, some of the people will sign up during that time period. I uh, just wanted to announce two concerts coming up uh, that the Society has. One is next week on uh, Friday, December 11th. That's the uh, second concert in our national uh, series. Remarkable 15 year old Chinese guitarist. Yeah, Joe and Daisy, I'm sure you saw him in the Zarya series. He did for life and he's only 15 years old. Marhal, <laughs> uh, really amazing player. Technically remarkable, but also just a very mature player. His, his uh, Chacon, which he'll be playing on Friday. Was really one of the best interpretations of that that I've ever seen. Several people said that. So, yes, it's a little bit discouraging and intimidating. He's now living in the U.S. Uh, he's studying with one of all our Waco and all the people out there on his So, it's a chance to see him in his first full length New York concert uh, at the beginning of his career. So, that'll be up at Symphony Space. Information for tickets is online. If you're a member, you do get a discount for that. You have to put in a discount code. It's a little more confusing this time because you actually go most of the way through the checkout process before it asks for your code. You just go through it as if you're going to pay full price and then put in your code and then they'll take it. Um, and then another concert is our New York City Guitar Orchestra concert, which is the following Friday on December 18th. And that'll be down at the Tim Reed Cultural Institute on um, West 13th Street. Uh, we'll be doing several uh, pieces from the first five years of our commissioning project. Uh, this is a short concert followed by a reception. Anybody who is interested in that group, interested in uh, playing in the orchestra, interested in coming back and playing in the orchestra again, uh, please come to that. Got a chance to talk to the musicians, hear some of the music, talk to the director, uh, and hopefully just have a great time um, at the concert and the reception that's following. Uh, and then the only other concert to mention, if you aren't already aware of it, the Night Secretary Live has put their own arrow playing on December 12th. Um, and then we'll have after that in January our next concert will be in Berkeley on January 15th. Um, and our, uh, our speaker at our next meeting is, is Ben Berger as well. So the general meeting will be good. All right, so it's a pleasure to have you out for the interview with us uh, tonight. Um, he uh, has recorded a couple of CDs, and his most recent one, he has some up here if you'd like to pick it up, is his Bach CD. And he's going to be talking to you tonight about playing Bach and tuning Bach and particular ideas he has about uh, doing that to bring out uh, some of the elements of the music. So, to all welcome. Suite was reworked. The 
fifth cello suite is the third uh, uh, lute suite. The the famous fugue uh, thousand and one also exists in a version for organ, BWV five thirty nine. We have many other examples, but I like to highlight one more. The second violin sonata in A minor also exists as uh, uh, in an arrangement for keyboard. And speaking about arranging for the keyboard, one of Bach's students, J.F. Agricola, once said that Bach actually often played the solo violin pieces on the clavichord, adding as much in the nature of the harmony as he found necessary. So from that statement, we get that when he would rework a piece, you know, he, he would change and stress here, add, add as much in the nature of the harmony as it found necessary. You know, to me, it's the, 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 the technical aspects of the, 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 the instruments he was describing for, or to highlight the, the acoustical qualities of the instruments he, he, he arranged, rearranged for, and so on. Now, <laughs> what I like to call the million dollar question which drove me for many years in, into my, my arrangements of Bach. How much would you think that Bach would have found necessary to alter if you were to transcribe them for our instrument, for the modern guitar? I don't know, nobody knows, maybe we'll never know, but we can pretty much make an educated guess. If we, for example, compare the cello works and the lute versions. So if you if you take it for example, like I said, the the fifth cello suite and compared to the third lute suite, you might get a sense of what what Bach was was uh, aiming for. However, uh, answering that question, like I said for for many years was my path, but Answering that question recently is no longer the goal for me. The goal for me, I think, is to be creative, as many other guitarists that I admire were. So I listed a few examples here. Barueco, you might be familiar with this. Uh, he, he recently released his recording and transcription of the first cello suite. Have you guys heard about it or, or, or listened to it? Well, uh, here's my tip for you. If it sounds amazing, uh, you should check it out. He, he adds, he dresses the original, adding a lot of bases, adding ornaments, making fuller harmonies. And I, I really like what he, what he did. Another guitarist that I really also admire, having high esteem, is Tillman Hopstock, are you familiar with Tillman? He's a great, not only a giant uh, German performer, but also a fantastic musicologist. And I, I, I recently saw him play at the GFA convention. And he would do something really crazy. He would add the bases, the ornaments, make fuller harmonies, etc. And then he would add new counterpoint. To the, to the original text of his own in the style of Bach. And it's mind blowing. And of course, speaking of the first cello suite, we, have, we also have uh, John Duarte's arrangement. It was the first one that I got familiar with. And say what you will, if it's in style, if it's not in style, but you cannot say it's not geomatic. Right? So, how to approach it? As I said, I, I wanted to be creative to, to find my own way, but in a different way. I, I, I would like to bring out the beauty of each line with all the polyphonics of divisions you can find. As I learned in a class I took when I was a student at Juilliard, there was a counterpoint class with Dr. Philip Lesser on his, his, his book, this Fire and the and then I, I, I actually found a way. Uh, I figured that if I choose
choose certain types of fingering options, I could reflect exactly what he was saying in theory. And then I, I got really excited and, and went for it. So a few words of the man here, Dr. Philip Lesser. He's a renowned composer, works recorded in nature labels uh, by great artists, Mount Dinerstein, Leipzig Radio Symphony Orchestra, and many others. He's a profound Bach scholar, with whom I, I learned a great deal at Julia. And the, the full name of his book is The Spiraling Tapestry, an inquiry into the contrapuntal fabric of music. And he teaches at Julia, counterpoint and other subjects since 1994. This is the book. The first volume is just text, just the theory. And then the second volume is a very rich compilation of examples to illustrate the theory. So what is he bringing to the table? What it was all about? Uh, he believes in the inner voices and what he calls contrapunto voices, which he abbreviates as CVs. So the contrapunto voices are any given number of notes, a group of notes, that can only connect by stepwise motion. So you have here one line, so it goes one step here, one step back, maybe one step down. It's always stepwise motion. So I ask you, what, what about if you have a leaf? Then it's not a CV anymore. Then it's actually what, what we call the leaf. He actually doesn't consider it to be a leaf. He considers it to be the cessation of this initial CV and the beginning of another. So this interval here uh, doesn't really exist for him. It in certain contexts, like the the pieces we're, the piece we're going to analyze, so it's a really interesting concept. So, what every time that, that we see a, a, a leaf in the examples, leaf with bows, uh, I'm actually going to refer to as a pitch gap. So here we have uh, an example of the theory. Ironically, it's not Bach. Schubert's. This is uh, the theme from Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, the first movement, which um, I'm sure is familiar to you. Uh, 
let me play for you uh, one and then two. Could you just remind me what CV means again? Oh, of course, yes. What C CV just is the abbreviation for contrapuntal voice. Right, thank you. Okay. He actually, I, I forgot to tell you, he actually says each CV makes a beautiful 
musical metaphor in the book is a single thread in a musical tapestry. So you have a lot of CDs that are here and then here and then there, and then they merge, and then they start to build those those lines and they make the drawings of the tapestry. So he makes a, a, a beautiful metaphor. It's, it's worth reading his book. Number two, a bit more subtle. Let me play the passage so that you get familiar. <laughs> There's a pitch gap between D and B, right? Yep. So we put this on one string and this on the other string. And then you get that resonance I was talking about, and you have the, the concrete sensation of two layers, because they're, they're coexisting, at least for some time. Right?
Are there any things that are in a single line? Is that what he's trying to say? In other words, it, instead of being a pure digre- uh, progression, mm-hmm. it's a blending of the voices up in, in that progression. Am I, am I correct? In other words, you uh, blend the sound rather than a... Well, the, the actual overlapping, the blending, right. if you want to can control, for example, mm-hmm. instead of... But, you know, for a fraction of a second, it's nice to sustain both, just to aid the listener that you have two layers. And then you can lift it if you want. It, if you go for it, it's straight. Know, there's like a little, you can actually play a chord open there. Keep on going, Adam. Next one. <laughs> It strikes me that if, if two people were singing that, and yeah. one was, then you'd really hear it because you'd hear the kind of the two different voices. Yes, and this and, uh, and you you would get the harmony for that brief instant, but you would hear the change of the of the of the second melody coming in because it's a different voice, and it would be very clear if people were singing it. Right. You, yeah. you mean if I if if, if I, I, I were singing it. one and you were singing the other. And we crossed right there, and then I went and you you stopped. Yeah, but to that moment, a, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Bach here is pretty much counting. If, if we if we think about this line, the frequency, the the red circles, we we have to count with the listener's memory. If you if you do with the blue fingering, it's going to be uh, easier. Like I was telling John, you're going to aid the listener to that direction. If if that's what you want, of course. One more.
then you go to a finger that reflects that. For example, if I choose the green fingering, the, the problem, I mean, it's not a problem, it's just that it doesn't fit the, the theory, is when you have the G and the E on the first string, then you lose the sense of this layer and this layer. You mix them. Right? Instead of... Uh, another way, a very pra practical way, if you want to explore that type of fingering, is I, I figure that you only finger notes in the same string if they're stepwise motion apart to reflect that theory. And then you, that with, with this one orientation, with this one instruction, you, you're gonna get all those fingerings automatically. Another way to think this is, if you have a leaf, that I'm calling pitch cap, it's automatically <coughs> another string. I had a leaf here. Minor third, so another string. Then we, the F sharp uh, is the merging point, like we saw in Schubert. And what about CP3 here, the D? Is it okay for it to hang? Notice that it's, it's not picked up by anybody in the measure. It won't only be picked up later. The thing about hanging pitches is that if it's a note that doesn't carry any unsolved tension, it's fine. If, if we have this D until the end of the piece, we'll be fine. But it's very interesting if you get a, a piece by box to analyze, you're gonna see that, for example, uh, a leading tone that is in the middle of the piece left hanging. Sometimes it's, it's left hanging for measures and measures and measures and measures but eventually it's gonna resolve. It's pretty amazing. If you get any piece by box and do an analysis of the hanging pitches, you're gonna see that the unsolved tensions, he resolves. And when he doesn't resolve, it's because he's resolving the next movement. <laughs> Good mark, guys. <laughs> and I, I rewrote here the, the notes that I circled with the stems up and down to exemplify the analogy. So um, stems up are the ones in red, then stems down the, the yellow, and then the D, just the syncopated. Uh, we just have up or down. If we had a, a, an inclined stem, I, I, would, I would put it here to differentiate the pose. Any other questions so far? Now, this part is very familiar to all of you, just the beginning. Now, I, I chose to, to work with this to tell you what to do with when we have just one single CV. And again, uh, we're just dealing with the top red object for now. So we have just one CV, F sharp, B, F sharp. So it's completely fine to, to just do it in one string. two or more CVs, two or more contrapuntal voices, uh, dis distributed on different strings. Because we want to make all those layers and all the structural intricacies. But when we have just one CV, like here, my question is, what do I do with it? Can I also break down in different strings? Like this. And the answer is yes, uh, but why? Why would I choose this ridiculously difficult? 
both finger and he with that large stretch you can keep it my answer is the, the overlap when we overlap uh, we have more articulation on we, we can do a sharp staccato we can do a molto legato. And of course, we can control the level of legato by lifting the finger. So I, I lift my fourth finger. But even when I, when I do that, because the one is in the bar here, always present. You're always going to have, for a fraction of a second, a uh, micro overlapping. Play in slow motion. And I, I kind of like that, that sonority. I, I think it gives a nice magical touch. Now, don't get me wrong. You, you can get a legato on one string. Too, but it's impossible to have a, that tiny overlap because, because nothing's overlap with it's just one string. So in a way, uh, the left hand functions as a piano pedal if you think about it. The the more you you lift or the more you you you, you keep the notes pressed, you know it's just like having a, a piano pedal more or less. And the downside, I already told you, is technically much more difficult. It's up to you to, uh, to decide if it's worth or not sacrifice. One more? One more time? Here we can see three layers, A, G, A, remember, stepwise motion, one, two, three. The other one is just the repeated E, which is a pedal note. And then a third CD in pink here. Wait, why is it more difficult, much more technically difficult to do it, the overlapping one? Oh, way? because of the, the stretch in that case. Oh, least. in that case. Yeah. Okay. If you want to keep the pattern, you have to really stretch and use the hinge bar. So you're doing the CV motion now. Hmm? You're doing the CV note motion right now, right? The CV what? The, you're doing your Dr. Lasser CV yes. motion. Yes, I'm doing as okay. here. Okay. Uh, different strings. Yeah. See, first string, second, third. Then you have that overlap. 
the, the difference? Thank you. 
entire prelude. It's just a bunch of 16th notes, right? There's no, Bach is not doing this, or that. It's just a bunch of 16th Sometimes it stands up or down, depending on where the note is on the staff. So should I really bother with those fingers to, to bring out the different layers, different CDs, etc.? My answer to this is, I think the structure goes beyond the writing. If you make a metaphor, like I made it in this slide, uh, with a poem, with words, they can hide more meaning than the, the actual words and the sequence of, of, of the words. Uh, and, and another thing is that, like I was saying, we don't have resources. We have stands up and stands down. What if you have five words? Do we have an inclined stem? Do we have a differently shaped stem? Or we don't. So we, we have to, it's up to us as artists to bring out uh, the things that we th think is more important and to, uh, to put in the second plan, in the, the second layer others, and then build our illusion, our perception of Choice of fingering really depends on your aesthetical taste and what you want to do, your artistic proposal. I wanted to, to translate all that, that theory and it fits. Say what you will, but, but if it really fits on the guitar, it, it holds true. Okay. Yeah? yeah, some of it's constrained by the difficulty in uh, achieving that. And, they, and some people want to say, well, if I can stay here, I can't do this kind of stretch that kind of Yeah. Sometimes yeah, you, you, you gotta you gotta compromise. Right. You can you have to see if it pays off. For me, I I I, I went through the fingerings and yes, I acknowledge it was super hard. But I I, I really wanted the result. I really want all that ringing, all, all those layers, all those CDs distributed in the different strings. I, I thought it was very poetical. Okay, last one, the ending. <laughs> Box music that you approach with this method, or what other styles? Um, 
different musical styles would you apply this method to? Yeah, it was interesting that the first example was Schubert. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 I've been working just, just uh, those works by Bach on, through, through that prism. Yeah. If, if you think about, uh, this is not going to be true for all music. Of course, if you get an aria, of course you're going to have a beat just one voice. You're not going to see two voices in, an, in a solo aria. But in this music, it's really fun to, to, to do that exercise and divide and distribute the, the CDs and the strings and to milk the overlapping. It creates beautiful sonorities. <coughs> yeah. Are there as many uh, choices on the cello for that prelude? Because it it seems to me that you have fewer strings and fewer ways of fingering. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I imagine that on the cello you can't do all those holdings. And yeah. We have more strings and, and we, have, uh, we have more of a vertical uh, approach to, to musical, or at least we have more vertical options. So we can put one voice here, one voice here, one voice here. On the cello, I, I would think it's hard. It would be hard. Yeah, they have more sustain. Right. I'm sorry? They have way more sustain than us. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes and no, though, because the bow's got to be. So, yeah. Because the strings another, are curved. Yeah, that's another thing. They, they take advantage of their uh, properties. And we as guitarists, we, take we can take advantage of this and, and make this work. And you may like it, you may not like it, but. Uh, it's consistent. Every single movement, every single bar, only if it's really, really, really difficult, I do something as a minor third in one string, for example, here. Mm -hmm. One, two, two, three. Yeah. But you su you switch yeah. strings. Thirds, six. If you add basses, if you make it 
more elaborate, like Tillman Hofstadt does, he adds a new kind of point. Then you don't have the luxury to do all those little details, all those little intricacies. But it still sounds great. I mean, it's a mind blowing performance. Are you it depends on what you want. Yeah? Are you familiar with a, a Manuel Ponce's arrangement of a spoon prelude? Oh, yes. There, there's a bass line that. Eight of symphony. Yeah. It's a very romantic version of it. Yeah. I don't have anything against it. Of course, it's, nobody can say it's in style, or the style of Bach, but it's in the style of Ponce. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem with that? <laughs> I just add one, it's a little off the topic a little bit, but I'm just wondering, I'm curious, do you have any sense of how faithful Bach would have been to his own scores? Because I've always wondered, like, he obviously wrote very detailed scores, and so maybe he would have played it exactly as he wrote. But then other times I think that maybe he would have done something like Tillman Hofstadt and would have, because he was such a great improviser, maybe <laughs> what he wrote down was more just like a jazz, like a, ch a chart for playing it. Well, if you think about the you know the fugue, the A minor fugue, ba -da -da, ba -ba -da, ba -da -da, ba on the violin. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, he, in the the keyboard version, BWV nine six four, he has no counterpoint, and I think he, sh he should because he's he's working on uh, on four the four strings of the violin. And then suddenly he has the sea of keys of keyboard. I guess my question is, do you think if you played it two nights in a row, would he have played the same way? For oh, us? well, that brings us back to, the, to that saying of, of, of Agricola. Uh, well, that, that doesn't really answer the question. His student, J.F. Agricola, used to say that he would play the violin pieces, adding as much in the nature of the harmony as he would have found necessary. But he, he didn't really say if he each time he, he would change. Mm -hmm. I would think so. I would think he would have fun with the counterpoint. Mm -hmm. well, Keep it from being boring to himself. Why not if you're right, yeah. Yeah. reinventing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no other questions? Thank you.